Okay, so um, my name is Gerrit and I'm sitting here in Munich in Germany. Um, I'm from Excellent Technologies, I'm a DevOps consultant and also one of the core developers of the Metal Stack, which is um, the project which we are going to talk about today. Um, yeah, this project was actually developed together with another company called the FITS, who is the actual investor and a German infrastructure provider for banks, actually. And yeah, we have just recently, or the FITS has just recently decided to open source this project, uh, which I think is great. We just finished moving uh, our repositories over to GitHub, I think, a week ago. So uh, it's not everything perfect just yet, but uh, I think it's in a state where you can start uh, trying it out and working with it. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty excited to show you these things because yeah, we've been working on this for a year and a half now and uh, we are all strong believers in our team and two open source projects and finally we can give something back to you. Um, so the entire metal stack uh, has quite some complexity um, which I cannot fully cover in technical and all technical details within this talk in this 30 minutes. Uh, but of course, if you have uh, questions after the talk, just, please just give me a hint and we can uh, answer all your questions there in this lecture. All right. <clears throat> so um, first things first, um, what is the metal stack? Basically, we are an API for metal as a service. And some of you might got worried, as I said, um, we made the software for banks. Uh, I do understand your worries, but you should not be too concerned uh, because we did not overload um, this project with too many features, I, I think, uh, that are relevant for banks, but it's just an all purpose uh, pr project which uh, can be useful for actually everybody. Uh, and we really focused on doing basic things right such that we can make it an essential building block of uh, our data center architecture. So we really focused on fast machine provisioning and uh, a modern networking approach during um, this, yeah, this first period of time. And this in, um, software could actually be interesting for you um, when you want to deploy Kubernetes clusters at scale in your own data center and emphasis is on your own data center because uh, we are not a public cloud offering or something like that. Um, you need to run the metal stack inside your own data center and run it by yourself. Um, yeah, this actually makes it interesting when, you're, yeah, when data sovereignty is a hard requirement for you, for instance, uh, or when you prefer to invest into your own hardware rather than uh, using public Kubernetes as a service uh, offerings. And also an interesting topic is of course edge computing. So um, due to our bare metal nature of this entire thing, uh, you can also run software uh, with native machine performance. So um, this could also be an interesting use case. And I think you can actually use it in many ways that we are not even uh, thinking about just yet. So um, you can get creative with this as well. It's fully open source and yeah. Um, the feel of it should be comparable to um, hyperscalers actually. So we wanted the API to behave similar to um, what end users are typically used to work with. Um, so yeah, it should just feel like uh, using a hyperscaler actually. Okay, so um, on-premise was a given requirement for us and for our customers as well, um, because banks cannot just move into public clouds uh, because they have special regulatory uh, requirements. Um, they are very strict about uh, contracts and stuff like that. And they require contracts, which you cannot simply get from a hyperscaler nowadays. So um, they had uh, also the data needed to reside in our own data centers. And um, you, yeah, the data should not cross any country borders and stuff like that. And this is why we actually developed this. And Actually, we got some benefits um, from running um, this entire thing on premise because um, actually we can also save some money with this because uh, yeah, the invest into the hardware will break even at some point uh, with um, the costs of public cloud offerings. And yeah, the price performance ratio is a little better there, I think. Of course, you have to manage all the things on your own. 
So um, yeah, you have to decide if you really want to do this, but if you want to go this way, um, then maybe this is interesting for you. Then um, another benefit that we got from the on-premise stuff is that we gained the full control over everything and we could design the things in the way we wanted to, which allowed us to do an almost shared nothing uh, kind of approach um, for the machine and the network layer. Um, so you have dedicated firewalls, dedicated load balancing for every user and project, and you're not interfering uh, with any other tenants at this um, time. And also, um, what was another advantage of doing that is that we have much easier access to existing networks of the company. So, because it's in the same data center, we could uh, easily establish um, connections into legacy networks um, and reach out from Kubernetes clusters into existing um, yeah, company networks, actually. Right, then why didn't we just use virtual machines? Um, Okay, so there, there are some advantages of bare metal over virtual machines that uh, we just don't want to miss, I guess. Um, one of it is uh, we have guaranteed performance. You have the highest possible disk I.O., for instance. Uh, you have direct disk access if you want it. Uh, so it's pretty fast. You don't have any noisy neighbors because you don't have to share your hardware with other tenants, which is also uh, security-wise, a nice benefit, I guess, because it mitigates the spectrum meltdown uh, issues um, that were there in the past, um, because you're not sharing uh, hardware with other tenants. Um, the overall stack gets a little slimmer, which is quite nice. So um, there are no hypervisors required, and our hope is uh, with a slimmer stack, you will also get uh, less bugs. And after all, there's still the option to put virtualization on top of everything if you really want to do that. So it's giving you um, yeah, just physical servers, right? And what you would do with it is up to you, right? So you can still deploy virtualization on top of that and you can do it the other way around. So I guess it's not a disadvantage. Okay, this is now uh, illustrating how our metal stack Look like looks like or the way we use the metal stack actually uh, in our entire environment and this is just our way of using it um, of course it's up to you what you do with it um, but we clearly had the intention of running kubernetes on top of everything in the end so um yeah we wanted actually to lead our customers into this new era of uh, running software on managed kubernetes so we yeah this was our overall goal in the in the end um, our stack consists of many cloud native projects, uh, projects that you should already be familiar with, I guess. And we are mainly using open source technology, um, which should prevent you from being vendor locked in the future and maintains your ability to change. Um, at the bottom, we have our hardware running in Rex in our data center. Um, then for the switches, we have Cumulus Linux. And on our worker nodes, we are running currently Debian, but there's also Ubuntu available, um, then all layers uh, yeah, in the data center are actually managed by our own Metal API, uh, which fully automates um, the parts in the data center. So you should not need any operations there uh, in these layers anymore because it's, everything is automated there. Our customers do not even get SSH access to the machines or something like that because uh, yeah, it's, should be, there should be nobody uh, accessing the machines. It should just offer you an endpoint for the API server to interact with. Then um, on top of that, we have put another great open source project, which we will talk about later. It's called the uh, Gardener. And Gardener actually um, deploys Kubernetes clusters. So uh, then we finally got some Kubernetes clusters on our physical servers. And then we have the application workload and other offerings like S3, that we provide with Rook, for example. Yeah, we are just deploying vanilla Kubernetes there. And this is how our stack looks like. Maybe it's already enough for you if you just um, have the machine provisioning and uh, users can create themselves physical machines and they get XSH access and can deploy something else onto that. But uh, we do it with Kubernetes. Right, let's now talk a little bit about technical uh, things that we've decided in the past. 
Um, so how did we build this entire thing up? Um, so all in all, the metal stack is a compound of microservices that we are all uh, that we all implemented in Golang. And the user-facing API is a traditional REST API, as you expect also from other cloud providers. Um, yeah, we're using Swagger there, but um, the, the microser um, microservices that are not public-facing, they are using gRPC or at least starting to move towards gRPC, which we uh, enjoy very much. It's much cooler. And yeah, when you get the metal stack into your data center, we can recommend you that you use our modular rack design. And our major principle is that we have racks that look more or less similar to reduce um, the maintenance overhead of the entire underlying automation. Um, so when you're just um, buying these racks, you have very little amount of cabling and you can simply extend your metal stack installation with more servers fairly quickly. You just have to put it into your data center and build partitions with it or uh, yeah, stuff like that. Okay. Then all components in our racks are redundant, such uh, that in case of a hardware failure, um, the servers are still maintaining network connectivity. And to make this possible, um, yeah, we cabled um, the switches in the cross topology, uh, which leads us to uh, our networking part, um, which I will <laughs> tell you about in yeah, just just little details and I'm also not from the networking team. Uh, I'm not very into the heavy details there, but I can give you some hints. Um, we have this quite modern approach, I would say, uh, which is based on layer three only um, with routing to the host, um, BGP and FRR as the routing suite. And I've put a book, uh, a book in the lower right corner, um, which was kind of the holy grail for our networking team for at least half of a year, I guess. And in this book, um, it pretty much describes how we implemented um, yeah, the, the actual network um, automation. Uh, we have small microservices actually running on the leaf switches and these are reconciling the current networking configuration every 15 seconds and they are reconfiguring the switch ports. And this is how we um, actually configure the networking for the entire thing. Um, so with this kind of setup, we are unable to actually use Metal LB and it works great for us, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's a load balancer and we can uh, get load balancing via the routing protocol with equal cost multipathing. Um, so there's no need for additional hardware load balances in this regard, and which was a nice advantage of um, this networking approach, I think. Right, um, let's continue with networking a little. Um, here you can see a, part a partition, and a partition is for us a group of racks, uh, but it can also be a single rack if you want, so um, it's maintained completely by the metal stack. So when you create a machine via the metal stack API, um, your machine is put into a private tenant network, um, which is completely isolated from other tenant networks using VRFs, and uh, only workers in the same tenant network can directly communicate with each other. Um, so this alone does not make so much fun because you're somehow <laughs> trapped inside your own network. You always want some external network connectivity going on. Uh, and for this, there's another speciality of our solution. You need to create a firewall. And firewalls are um, just as worker nodes, the same kind of machines, but they serve a special purpose. They can terminate VRFs and establish connections to other networks. Um, and you can freely decide to which networks you can uh, connect your firewall with. You can connect it to the internet and then it will announce default routes for um, the workers in the private tenant network um, yeah, to, to the internet. So all leaving traffic from private tenant network is routed through the firewall and you can then define a set of rules there. Um, yeah. Now, I also want to give you a brief impression of how machine provisioning works, just, just that you can imagine what happens in the background when you create a machine. So in the beginning, a machine is not allocated. Uh, when a machine is not allocated by a user, um, the machine is being placed in a special Pixie Boot network. 
And in this Pixie Boot networks, um, the machine starts up in booting a discovery image. And this we call the metal hammer. The metal hammer is a small RAM disk, actually. And the metal hammer automatically inventorizes the machine. So it finds out how many CPUs does the server have, how much memory, it looks at the disk capacity, also looks uh, via LLDP at what neighbors do I have. And it's reporting all that stuff to the brain of our application, the Metal API. Um, with this neighbor information, we can figure out the cabling and which ports are being used um, for this machine. So uh, you don't have to inventorize stuff on your own. It can find out the data details on its own. Um, then the Metal Hammer will prepare the machine for provisioning. It will wipe the, wipe the disks and ensure that um, the machine is booting in UEFI mode and things like that. And then it will go into wait mode. So it will be waiting for a user allocation. And as soon as a user wants to allocate a machine, the Metal Hammer starts uh, to pull the target operating system that the user wanted to have installed on this machine. Uh, yeah, it burns it into the disk, it injects the SSH keys that the user have added and it runs ignition user data. So we are using ignition and not cloud uh, in it because it's just much slimmer and I think it's just two megabytes or something. And we wanted the stuff to be pretty fast. And I can show you that it is actually pretty fast in a second. Um, in the meantime, the machine uh, is put in out of the Pixie booting network and put into the private tenant network. And then the machine does a K exec into the new operating system kernel. So you don't need to reboot this machine. Um, and this will also make it much faster. You're just um, going into the new um, operating system kernel and bam, you're, you're there. Um, this is how um, it actually looks like when you want to create a machine. We have no UI dashboard or something like that. We would like to have one, but we are not front end developers. <laughs> so maybe someone wants to write this in the future. But uh, right now we only have uh, CLI clients and uh, client libraries. And this is a Go client library that you can see here. Um, an example for the machine create request. So um, the machine is going to be allocated in a partition in Nuremberg. This NVG stands for Nuremberg. Um, the machine has a name, a host name, and you can choose uh, the image. Currently, we officially support Ubuntu 1910 and Debian 10. Um, but you could also add your own images as well. It's not too hard, I can tell you that. Um, and from the reported amount of disks and memory and CPUs, um, the Metal API also matched the uh, machine size. So um, we have different amount of, uh, of sizes available and we call this one size C81X large X68, which is uh, super microservice, 96 gigabytes of RAM and I guess 24 CPUs or something like that or 48, I'm not sure. And then you can also put this into networks, into your private tenant network. And or if you want to announce internet IPs, through this machine, then you also put this into the internet network. And what will happen then? Uh, I can show you now in a small uh, screen capture. I will start this in a second. Uh, so this is actually real time. And I, yeah, this is how oh, it's already running. <laughs> Wait a second, can we restart this? Okay, no problem. Um, it has just started uh, to pull the operating system image and now it burns it to the disk. And now it's doing uh, running the ignition stuff and it's already booting the new kernel. And now it's, uh, yeah, it was now a little bit too fast, I guess, um, but it's actually that fast. <laughs> it takes around a minute to provision a machine. So uh, it feels a bit like using a VM, I hope. So this was our actually goal. Um, this is an IPMI, IPMI console of the server. And now you can see the operating system has come up and you can log in and then there's Ubuntu installed on the operating system. So your provisioning comes of about one minute here. Right, let's now talk about um, the hardware we currently support. Um, adding more machine types and manufacturers is quite cumbersome. So um, we are making on, uh, we are working on making this easier in the future, but um, for the moment, um, you would be probably better off uh, to just use the hardware that we are using uh, if you don't want to dig too deeply into this code. 
Um, our switches are from Edge Core and is required to run Linux based operating systems on these switches. We use Cumulus and um, the routing daemon has to be FRR because the automation is uh, yeah, just built on FRR configs. Um, the worker nodes and firewalls are all super microservers and we already have one adopter who will be adding Lenovo support, I guess. So it's pretty likely that we will also support Lenovo, Lenovo in the future. And that's basically everything that I want to tell you about this low level stuff and machine provisioning. We will now uh, bring Kubernetes into the game. Um, by now you should have a basic understanding of what MetalStack is actually capable to do. And um, yeah, how do we get, got, uh, get Kubernetes on top of that now? So in order to deploy a lot of Kubernetes clusters, we have found a very promising open source project, which is called the Gardener. Maybe some of you have already heard about this. And yeah, the Gardener actually manages Kubernetes clusters at scale. So it's capable of running thousands of clusters actually. I think um, yeah, the guys from SAP, this is an SAP product, uh, are running more than 2000 clusters in production with that. So uh, this is pretty cool. And we implemented all the necessary components to make MetalStack uh, working nicely with Gardner. And the Gardner team is actually pretty, pretty great. Um, they are taking a lot of time to help people um, with this. So if you're not even interested in the MetalStack, then you should definitely try out Gardner as well, uh, still because uh, I think it's a great product. And from Gardner's perspective, we are just another cloud provider and we implemented all the parts to act as a cloud provider. Yeah. Um, so let me explain you the main principle of how Gardner works. Um, you will always start with a Kubernetes cluster, which is your initial cluster, your starting point for creating more Kubernetes clusters. And the basic idea is that you can deploy a so-called uh, seed cluster and the seed cluster is a cluster that only contains control planes for other Kubernetes clusters that are called shoots. And yeah, in the seed cluster, in the shoot namespaces, um, yeah, Gardner deploys all essential parts of a Kubernetes master, which uh, is, are for instance, etcd, um, the kube API servers, kube controller managers, kube schedulers, uh, and things like that. And then Gardner will create worker machines, uh, at the cloud provider to join their respective Kubernetes control planes. And this is how you can grow more and more um, clusters you know, with the Gardener. And when you get really crazy, you can also uh, declare one of your shoots to be another Gardener seed. And then this shoot can uh, also host more control planes and you can yeah, have more uh, Kubernetes clusters. And this is what they call the cubeception, right? Because you can make a shoot, another seed, and then host more control planes on that. And yeah. So this is how this works. And in order to uh, make this all happen, we also had to integrate uh, Kubernetes into um, the metal stack a little. So we had to write an old, our own uh, cloud controller manager, um, which implements a Kubernetes cloud provider interface and yeah, Maybe you're aware of it, that every cloud provider has a cloud controller manager on Kubernetes and it's a bridge between the cloud provider and Kubernetes to make Kubernetes uh, get additional information about the nodes. Uh, yeah, gives the ability to um, create load balancers at the cloud provider automatically and things like that. And we also actually um, provide the Metal LV configuration for our machines um, through the Metal Cloud Controller Manager. Um, also, um, it acquires IP, address, uh, IP addresses and stuff like that for service type load balancers. And now there's one confession that I have to make. Um, we only support local storage for the time being. So there's no cloud storage yet. Um, I can also say something to this uh, a little later, but um, we, yeah, for, for the time being, you have to use local storage only. And for that, we implemented a small CSI plugin, which is working a bit like Rancher's local path storage provisioner. Um, it's pretty simple, uh, pretty simple. It creates logical volumes and mounts them into the file system. And then uh, your pods can write into this mounted file system into the logical volumes. And then there's also a small firewall policy controller, 
and the firewall that we are creating with the metal stack is not part of the Kubernetes cluster itself, but it is watching the Kubernetes cluster using the client Go libraries and it's particularly inter interested into um, network policies. So when you are deploying network policies into your Kubernetes cluster, it will create um, firewall rules on the firewall, yeah, respectively. And now some words towards CNI. Momentarily, we use Gardner's default CNI, it's Calico. Um, but we are not sure if this is um, the final solution for us because we already had some trouble with Calico um, with uh, liveness readiness probes because we are running a few more pods on most machines than usual um, because we have yeah, quite strong machines actually. And yeah, it's actually doing much more than we actually need because we have this MGP in the data center. And I think that Cilium would be a better fit for us because then we could just uh, use a direct routing mode and the pod IPs would be automatically announced via FRR um, and it would be just a better fit for our infrastructure. So probably this is going to come. Uh, yeah, so this is, where, this is where we are now. We are in the early production phase since uh, Q1. We have three data center locations with uh, 100 servers in each location. Uh, we're in alpha state and we yeah, when you start to work with it, you should expect API changes to come and yeah, other adopters are starting to try out the metal stack now. So we're excited about that. Uh, things that are gonna come are finding a right storage solution. So we took ourselves a year and a half to make the network and machine provisioning. And we also want the storage solution to feel in the same way that we made the other things. So we are still looking around for nice solutions and we also already had some interesting uh, talks with other companies and maybe we'll go for something like NVMe over TCP, but um, it's not 100% certain right now. So uh, this is gonna be <laughs> exciting as well, but uh, we will find something because we know that as a user, you do not want to care about persistent storage too much. Um, so we will give this to the user at some point in time. And we will further work on hardening the stack. And at the moment, when you go to our GitHub repositories, there's very sparse documentation and we have documentation, but it's not ready for being open source yet. So we are working on that. For the time being, you will, yeah, you should just contact us, I guess, if you have any questions, uh, not looking for too much documentation, but it will follow. Um, we try to further yeah, simplify the deployment of the entire thing. Um, it's not so easy to deploy this if you really want to go to production with it. And yeah, you just also feel free to reach out to us if you're encountering any issues or if you want to use this seriously. Um, Gardner integration performance tweaking is also a topic which is still present because at the moment we have some uh, tasks in the flow which are taking just more time than they need to take. And we will yeah, do this together with the Gardner team and make this faster. And I think eight minutes of cluster provisioning time is realistic. And then we try to further simplify the extension points for adding new hardware. And yeah, as I already said, we are approaching Cilium. If you want to try this out for yourself, um, we have a small development uh, environment, which is completely virtual and can run on your notebook. Um, it's called the mini lab. Uh, it has some requirements. Uh, it requires Kubernetes and Docker for the control plane and then Vagrant for the entire switch plane. And we do not like Vagrant that much, but uh, it provides very close simulation of what the actual uh, setup is doing because we are using um, official uh, cumulus images on that. and. Uh, also the net topology generator and stuff like that. And you can also pixie boot clients with this. So this is cool and Docker Compose. Right, and this was actually my talk. Um, yeah, and follow us on Twitter. We, we just yesterday we released our first website. So it's also pretty small right now, but uh, something is there, at least contact information, uh, yeah. We also have a Slack channel. Uh, yeah, you can find it on, on the web page and you can follow us on Twitter as well. And thank you all for uh, having us. 
if you have questions, just reach out to us, write it into the rejects Slack channel or directly to me, whatever. We will find ways. So thanks everyone. That's it. Thanks, Garrett. Um, I have a couple of clarifications for the audience. And then uh, we have a question from one of the attendees and I have a few of my own if, there, if there's time. Um, one thing to clarify, just because I used to work at a company called Garden, and I just wanted to say that the company Garden.io is completely unrelated to the SAP project Gardener. So those are different things. Yep, completely um, different. So I, I just like to clarify something, because I think that's the most fascinating part of this for me. Uh, when, you, when you're provisioning uh, bare metal machines, they're actually running on your premises, uh, but they're metal machines, uh, bare metal machines controlled by the users. Exactly. You, at, as soon as you give it to a user, then you somehow lost some control over that machine, but you can get it back um, using IPMI and also the network layer, so you can get off the customers then. Um, but yeah, they, they have the real physical machine at their hands when you, when you are creating a machine. I find that fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> hey, Bill, do you want to uh, talk about the question from the audience? Yeah, so we have two different questions from the audience. Um, so the first one, uh, do you run uh, Ceph on the same server as you're running your Kubernetes workloads? Um, yeah, so you've already seen that we are creating clusters uh, with the Gardener, and then you have the shoot cluster, which feels like you are having a cluster on GKE, a GKE, and then we deploy Rook on that, and we have access to local disks, and we have special server type for that, so we have servers with a lot of uh, disks and hard disk space with, I don't know, uh, super micro super servers, and yeah, then Rook will grab all the disks by itself and create yeah, SIF storage on that. So, cool. an, so someone in the audience uh, asked something which I had actually written down to ask anyway. <laughs> um, so Martin is asking, are you aware of Kubernetes' uh, cluster API? And I, I wanted to ask, because I've worked closely with them. Uh, so they do provisioning and for cloud providers mostly. Uh, yeah. Would it be compatible or possible at some point to provision bare metal clusters with cluster API tooling? So I know that the Gardener has one team member who is uh, working specifically on uh, cluster API and he's also in the, I think, official uh, cluster API SIG. So um, Gardener tries to integrate its solution to be yeah, compatible with the uh, cluster API. Um, yeah, at the moment, I think uh, they are trying to get their principle also to be accepted in an official way because you have a shared control plane there. And I think in the official plans were that you have dedicated master nodes and worker nodes, but in this way you would have one class cluster with a lot of masters and individual um, workers. And I think they are working with this will on that such that, um, yeah, the location of the masters are actually not a matter anymore. So uh, they are working on that and it should be compatible in the future. Cool, uh, that is fascinating. I, I really love hearing about this topic. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we can't chat about it for longer. We need to introduce our uh, next speaker. So thank cool. you so much, Garrett. Uh, this is a fascinating talk.